We are in the Gospel of Mark, and we have been for some time now working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Here's, here's where, we're, where we're at right now. We have seen Jesus do all kinds of things quickly in the Gospel of Mark. Peter, the disciple Peter, the spokesman for everyone... Peter is actually telling Mark what to write down. Mark is Peter's secretary, really. And so, so Mark is writing down what the, the disciple Peter has been telling him to write down. Peter is that guy who doesn't want to stand around and have a long conversation with you. Okay, Peter's that guy who wants to just simply tell you. Here's the facts. Here we go. And so when you read the book of Mark, it's not like reading the other Gospels, Matthew, Luke, and John. It's not like reading those. Although they tell the same stories, Matthew, Luke, and John are a little more drawn out. Mark, uh, through the words Peter is saying, is just hammering home these, these details as if Jesus' life has no rest in it and it's from one event right to the next. That's how his book reads. And it's been doing that for the last seven chapters, chapters 1 to 7. Well, now we come to the middle of the book. And we come to chapter 8, and in chapter 8, there's a turn that takes place. All of a sudden... In the book, rather than starting to start keeping on recounting all of these events and all of these miracles and all the uh, exorcisms of demons and all of that, rather than dealing with that part, there is a big shift, and the shift is Jesus turning his face towards the cross. It's, it's, there, there's just an obvious change as you read through the book, and this is what we come across. The portion of Scripture we're going to look at today is the very first portion of Scripture that I was assigned way back in college in my Greek studies. I was assigned this very portion of Scripture to translate from Greek to English. And I even, go ahead, put this image up. I even have my old Greek Bible that I still use when I'm doing word studies. And this is Mark, you can't read this, but this is Mark chapter 8. It starts chapter 9 on your right, but chapter, uh, chapter 8, the left side, that's the area we're going to be studying today. And, and so I remember when I had this assignment and I had to translate this into English and then I turned in my my a translation to my professor and I got a B and I just felt I felt really good I I remember getting the B and walking away from the professor's office and and thinking I just translated the Bible I mean this is this is a big thing this is a big deal and I and I had a good time trying to understand the meanings behind words and the all the origins of the words, which this means nothing to you right now. But to me at that moment in time, it, it meant absolutely everything. What I've learned over the years though, uh, keep that picture up there. What I've learned over the years is that while I, I was fairly capable of translating the Greek into English... Uh, and if you don't keep up with that, you just kind of lose the ability to do that at times. But I was fairly capable of being able to do that. But the real trouble I had was translating the message into my own life. It was one thing to find out what the words meant, what the, what the scriptures said as it's recorded in the original language. But it's another thing to take what you translate and apply it to your life. It's easy to hear, hard to do. And this passage of Scripture, Mark chapter 8, is going to be for you one of the most difficult things that you've ever heard. You may have heard this before. And if you're rehearing it, you're going to say, that's exactly right. That is hard to do. So we're going to be digging in there. Um, uh, digging into Mark chapter 8. And I want to start with verses 27 to 30. 
Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. So Pat, if you have that scripture ready to go, here we go. Jesus and His disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, He asked them, Who do people say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. But what about you, He asked. Who do you say that I am? Now I want you to hold on to that. Okay, I, I want you to hold on to that. Peter answered, You are the Messiah. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about Him. Now Jesus has been with the disciples for a couple of years now. They have seen Him. They have been eyewitnesses to Him exhibiting power over sickness and death. They have seen Him exhibit power over demons and the principalities of darkness. They have seen Him exhibit power over paralysis. They, they have seen Jesus do all of this stuff. And so when, when it comes to this point, this very point in time, as Jesus is just with His disciples, He asks them one simple question. Question. Look at the question right here on the overhead. Now this is big. Who do you say I am? Now I want you to leave that picture, that question right up there. Who do you say that I am? Because the, re the reason I want you to leave this up there is I want you, right now you weren't prepared for this and I know it. But what if Jesus showed up right now, right here, and He looked you right in the face and He asked you this one question. Who do you say that I am? Because that's what He's doing here. Who do you say that I am? Now that's what Jesus is doing. And, and just right now, in your own mind, I'd love for you to be able to answer that question. Don't say anything out loud. You're not being put on the spot. If Jesus said that to you right now, asked you that question, how would you answer Jesus? Other than just falling on your face. <sighs> who do you say that I am? Well, guess who opens their mouth first? Peter does. Peter loved to talk. He loved to hear himself talk. He, like I said, he didn't want to carry on a conversation with you unless he was the one talking. He didn't have time for anything else. And so Peter answers the question and, he's, and he makes this very bold statement. He makes this very true statement and he declares, You are the what? You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, in the book of Matthew, who gives us a little more details, this is just a little bit for, for your information, it is from this event that the Rock Church got its name. Because the book of Matthew will tell you that when Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, when he said it, Jesus responds in the book of Matthew and he says, that's exactly right. You have said it correctly. Meaning, Jesus was going, that's right, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. Jesus is accepting that answer as the true answer. And then he looks at, at the uh, 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 disciple Peter and he says to him, and Peter, you are... Let's see, how do I want to do this? He says to him, before he says Peter, he says Simon, because that's what... Peter was known as before. This is where Peter gets his name changed. Your name is Simon, which means stone. But now you are rock. And on the rock of the truth that you just spoke, I will build my church. And that rock will be so strong that the gates of hell cannot even prevail against it. Now that's how, that's how Jesus would respond to this. And that's the picture that, that we understand here. Now things right after this... Oh, listen. We know Peter well enough that he felt like I did when I walked away from that translation with a B. Going, yes, I did it. 
Peter, I, when Jesus is complimenting him and almost applauding him, you can feel in Peter it just welling up going, yeah, I got the right answer. Wouldn't it be cool if Jesus asked you a question and you had the right answer? And didn't you really hate that person in class? Anyway, um, they, they had the, Peter had the right answer and Jesus says, that's exactly right. And I'm even on that answer, on the truth of that, I'm going to build my church. That's what's going to happen. And so it's from this scene that the Rock Church gathers its name. But things get really complicated really quick. All right? I'm going to read to you a verse and a half beginning in verse 31. So right immediately after this, while they're still talking, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man, what's that word? Next word? Must. That's a little word, but here it's a big, big word. That the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he, what? Must be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Now, this is what you need to know. This is the very first time that Jesus informs His disciples that He was going to die. He's going to do it two other times. Next week I'm going to talk about that. But just for where we're at right now, this is the first time that any of them have the plan told to them that Jesus is going to die and not just that he's going to die but that he must die it has to happen so so Jesus says this for the first time now the other thing that you need to understand when G, when Jesus asked the disciples who do you say that I am Peter said he is the what the Messiah, the Messiah. now I, I need you to catch this this is the very first time in all of history, the very first time in all of history that anyone ever equated Messiah with suffering and death. And while Jesus had just let them in on the fact that He was going to have to die, He must die, and He must rise again, they have, they have just understood Him to be the Messiah and they are not going to connect this really well. Are you with me? They, they're going to have real trouble with this because all through the hundreds and thousands of years prior to from the time Israel came into existence and God working through them and speaking of the Messiah that was coming, they never pictured, never ever pictured a Messiah that was going to suffer. And they never ever pictured a Messiah that would die. I mean, that didn't even make a connection to them. There was no historical reference for them. Some of you might say, well, yeah, but haven't you stood up here and taught about all those prophecies about the Son of God and all those things? Yes, I have. But the, in the Jewish mind, those prophecies of a suffering servant had nothing to do with a Messiah. It was just, in their eyes, a picture of a guy who was going to come along and who was going to, he was going to suffer, he was going to die, but he certainly wasn't going to be a Messiah. They never made that connection. This is the first time Jesus challenges the mindset, the culture, the teaching, and everything of the Jewish people. In their mind, let me, let me tell you, let me show you here on the screen. In their mind, the Messiah would do the following things. Just look at this. He would defeat evil. He would defeat injustice. He would uh, make everything right. He would throw, overthrow all of the rivals to Israel and He would establish His throne where? In Jerusalem. And He would establish His throne in Jerusalem. That was their view of the Messiah. And once that throne was established, it would never be moved and Israel would be God's centerpiece forever and forever and forever in the kingdom of God. 
in their mind, a suffering Messiah, look at this, a suffering Messiah is unthinkable. A suffering Messiah made no sense. And a suffering Messiah was a failure as a Messiah. He wouldn't be the true Messiah. So Jesus says that as Messiah, He must suffer. Now He's telling His disciples this. These guys are all Jewish and they are, they are all kind of... You, you can almost see the confusion in their eyes and hear the whispers among them. And, and what He's saying is that it will definitely happen. It has been the plan all along and it's about right here that Peter absolutely loses it. Okay, and here's how he loses it. This is in verse 32. And Peter did what? Took him aside. Are we up there? Yeah. Peter took him aside and began to do what? Rebuke, Rebuke him. Now I want you to just imagine the pride in in Peter's response here. Jesus has just accepted the title from the, and, and told the disciples, you are right, I am the Messiah. Then he says, I must die and I must rise again. Those things must happen. They are not optional. They must happen. And I, the Messiah, am going to do that. I'm going to suffer and die. And they, they absolutely lose it in confusion. And Peter, the spokesman, does what the smartest person in the class normally does. Because he, he just answered the question of Jesus correctly. Who do you say that I am? And so Jesus makes a statement that he must suffer and die. And Peter, you can kind of see him. Hey Jesus, come over here for a minute. We need to have a talk. You and me. We need to have a come to... We need to have a uh, come, to, come to Peter meeting. Uh, and, but come on over here. So, so Jesus goes aside with, with Peter and the scripture says, and Peter began to rebuke him. This word rebuke is not a kind word. It's a word that's reserved for when you are dealing with the forces of evil. When you are dealing with Satan. When you are dealing with those powers. This is the word that's used there. And Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to speak to him as, as if, he is speaking to Satan himself. Matthew is going to tell you what Peter says. May it never be. May it never be that, that you would do that. Well, I want you to notice what happens next because this is, this is a gold nugget. You want, some, you want to walk out of here just going, Man, God, you are so great. You are so awesome. And you, you are so concerned about me that you would give yourself for me. Okay, I want you to see what happens here. And just follow it along. This is in uh, Mark 8.33. And this verse, Pat, I just want you to leave up on the screen when we put it there. Here we go. But when Jesus turned and looked at His disciples, He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And, and I, I just want you to notice the words that are used in this rebuke. Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus for even saying that he would suffer and die. Jesus says to Peter, he rebukes Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Now, when have we heard that phrase before? Anyone remember? This phrase was used right after Jesus was baptized and He was taken out into the wilderness and He was taken out into the wilderness for what reason? He went by Himself to be tempted by who? Satan. By Satan. And Satan tempts him in three different ways. And finally, Satan says to Jesus, 
I will give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will just fall down and worship me. You want some power? You want some authority? Just fall down and worship me. And if you do that, you can have all the world. You can have it all. And Jesus responds to Satan and says, Get behind me, Satan. All of a sudden, we're seeing that phrase used again. Get behind me, Satan. He's not saying it to Satan this time. I, I, at some level, he is. But he's looking Peter right in the eye, the guy that got the answer right on the test, the guy that was the smartest disciple in the room, the guy that called Jesus the Messiah, and all of a sudden, he's being called Satan. Get behind me, Satan, Jesus says. Why does Jesus use such strong words here? Why does He look at Peter and call him Satan when we know say, Peter's just trying to do a good thing? I think, I think Peter's mind is in the right place. He doesn't make the connection yet. Well, I, I would say two things. And I think these will be on the overhead here. There was a temptation to trash the plan here. A temptation to trash the plan. There was a temptation here to forget about humanity and forget about us. Look, Jesus, you can't talk like that. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. You don't have to go through all this suffering. You don't have to go to a cross. You don't have to deal with death. You're the Messiah. You don't have to do this. And the temptation must have been there for Jesus to just kind of go, gosh, thank you so much, Peter, for telling me that. Thank you for reminding me of all my power. I really don't have to do that. And he would just then go on his merry way and trash the plan. And if he had done that right there, we all are in a heap of trouble. All of humanity is going to be in a heap of trouble if Jesus trashes that plan. Now put, I want you to put that verse back up on the scene. Okay. I want you to look at this and see if from this verse you cannot tell what caused Jesus to end up rebuking Satan, rebuking the temptation, and continuing on towards the cross. Do you see it there? Do you see it in the verses? Because this is big. When Jesus turned and looked at His disciples, He rebuked Peter, Get behind me, Satan. He said, You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Okay? I want you to follow me here. But when Jesus turned and what? When He turned and looked at His disciples. Do you know before He, he told Satan to get behind Him, before He rebuked, Peter, and in the, in the course of doing that, rebuking the temptation of not going to the cross, he looked at his disciples. Now, we don't know anything else except before he answered, he turned and looked at his disciples. But it makes me ask the question, well, when he turned and looked at his disciples, what did he see? What did he see that would cause him to look back at Peter and call him out and say, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have, you don't have the concerns of God in your heart. You have your own, your own concerns in your heart. I wonder. I wonder when he turned around and looked at the disciples, did he see 11 other men who without him going to the cross, he knew they would be bound for hell. I wonder if when he turned around and looked at the disciples, was he able, in, in, in a, a viewpoint that only God could have, was he able to look all down through history and see some bum named Rick Clark um, uh, who was raised in Virginia Beach or see or look down all through history and see you and see us as totally hopeless people if He doesn't go to the cross. 
I don't know what happened there, but all we know is before he answered, before he rebuked Peter and Satan, he turned around and looked at his disciples. And there is something that happens that after he turns around and looks at the disciples, he turns back around to Peter and says, No way, buddy. Get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to fall for that. Because all of humanity is hanging on my death on the cross. It's totally dependent on my resurrection from the dead. It certainly emboldened Jesus to keep pressing forward. You'll see that when we dig in deeper next week. So Jesus says, He's a king who must die. He's a, king, he's a Messiah who must die and He must rise again. He must suffer. He must die. He must rise again. But He doesn't stop there and this is where... Now listen, get ready because it's going to get really tough. This is where we take this home because all I've told you are things you know basically. Yeah, Jesus was born to die and He was going to die and He was going to rise again. Okay, okay, okay. Get on with it. Well, Jesus is going to get on with it. He says this, I'm not only taking up the cross, but now you must take up the cross as well. He's not giving an option here. I must take up the cross. Now you must take up the cross as well. This is going to be one of the toughest statements of Jesus that you will ever wrestle with right here. Mark 8, verses 34 to 38. Here's how he puts it. Then he called the crowd to, to him along with his disciples and he said, Whoever wants to meet, be my disciple, what's the next word? Must deny themselves. So, so what we're getting ready to read here is not an option for you. It is not an option for me. This is what you must do. What do I have to do to follow you, Jesus? Well, you must do this. Whoever wants to be my disciple or follower must deny themselves and take up their what? Cross. Take up their cross and follow me. Now before we go to the next verse, you can leave that verse up there. They must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. There was a philosopher, a Christian philosopher named Francis Schaeffer. He's in heaven now. But I remember what he did with this verse. And, and it, it was really good how, how he dealt with this verse because he pointed out really what was in my heart when I was coming to faith in Christ and probably what was in your heart when you were coming to faith in Christ. We want to be followers of Jesus. We want to be forgiven. We want to know we're going to heaven when we die. And so when someone stands up, a preacher stands up, or somebody else come, uh, just speaks to you and says, you know, would you like to be a follower of Jesus because He loves you so much, we go, boom, yes, I want that. I need that. We want to follow. But then Francis Schaeffer says, and that desire is so strong that we totally overlook the commands of his followers. Because before you can be the follower, you first have to be the denier. You have to be willing to deny yourself. And then you have to be willing to take up your what? Your cross. So if we, if we put that in today's vernacular, Cindy and I were just talking about this this week. You know, all, all you folks who have spent a lot of fine money to buy this cross you dangle around your neck, in today's, we're like, like if we were back in Jesus' time and you were walking around with a cross hanging around your neck, you'd get so many weird looks. I don't know how many diamonds, it didn't matter how many diamonds would be on that cross. You would get all kinds of weird looks. Because in today's world, it would be like you walking around with this nice gold necklace and an electric chair hanging around your neck. <laughs> and if you saw someone doing that, you'd be going, well, I reckon they're pro-capital punishment. <laughs> I mean, and you would go, 
that's weird. And you would go, well, I don't think I really want to know that person. Um, and, and so, but, but that's, that's what Jesus is saying must happen is that you and I are to take up, we're to deny ourselves, and then we're to take up an instrument of torture. And once you've done that, follow me. Come on. You want to follow me? And see, Rick Clark wants to say, Oh, Lord Jesus, I want to follow you. I want to follow you out of the tomb. I want to follow you in life. I want to follow you when everything is good. And Jesus is saying, I know that, but to follow me, You've got to deny yourself. Tell me someone in this culture that teaches you to deny yourself anymore. You've got to deny yourself and you've got to take up your cross. So, what does it mean to take up my cross? What, what does it mean? Uh, well, I haven't even read all these verses yet. Let me, let me get back here. That was just one verse. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His Father's glory with the holy angels. Man, this is, this is big talk here. So what does it mean for me to deny myself, to take up my cross? What does it mean for me to lose my life for Jesus' sake? Is He calling us all to martyrdom? Is He calling us to, to go and find the opportunity to be killed for Him? Is that, is that what He has in mind? And, and so I, I want to deal with this quickly. And, I, and there's going to be a lot of information right up here on the screen. What it means is this. The Christian life is a life of dying. The Christian life is a life of dying. Dying to what? It's dying to my identity without Christ. This is, that's important. This is important. Who do you identify with? Are you identified simply with yourself? I'm Rick Clark. I call the shots in my life. I make decisions for me and that's that. Who do you identify your life with? Do you identify your life with yourself or do you identify your life with Christ? Because this is what he's talking about in denying yourself. The Christian life is a life of dying, dying to my aspirations without Christ. I encourage students in college. I encourage students who are soon going to be graduating at the end of this next school year and moving on. As you look in this life and you're wondering, what am I going to do with my life? What do I do? You typically begin to ask the questions of, okay, what makes the most money? Which field needs the most help? And you, be, and you tend to make decisions based on those types of things. I'm going to ask you to add one more question to the equation when you're trying to figure out out what you're going to do with the rest of your life and for the rest of your life and it's this what God do you want me to do for the rest of my life I'm asking you to consider praying about that I'm asking you to consider reading the scripture and trying to become familiar with with God's desire for you as a follower of Jesus God what do you want me to do in life because I certainly believe that God gives gifts to His people that they can use in their life for the glory of God. He gives us gifts and abilities, all of us. We are not unique in that way. If we are His followers, He has given you a gift and an ability to be able to use to bring glory to Him. And whatever it is you do, whatever it is you do, you do it with all your heart to the best of your ability 
so that it will cause people to speak well of Jesus. Here's what I mean by that. I'll be talking to a stranger um, and and trying to see if we have any connections with other people. And, and I'll say something, I, I, I'll say, do you, do you know this person? And, and, you, and they'll, when they answer yes, if we find out we have a connection, oh yeah, well, you know what, they, they come to church, they come to church, they're just really good people. You know what you don't want to hear? You don't want to hear that person that you're speaking to go, they come to church? Now, you don't want to hear that. We want our lives to be able to influence other people to the point that when, when they hear your name, they can easily make a connection that you are a follower of Jesus. We, we want that. That's a part of what we're doing. Dying to my aspirations without Christ. I'm dying to the control I have over my life. I'm dying to the control I have over my life. I no longer call the shots. I say this again. You've heard it before. And, and, um, but, but I say it to you again. Rick Clark in controlling his life is living his life on a beach somewhere. Serving Jesus for sure. But living his life on a beach somewhere. And it's not the beaches of the Ohio River. This is Rick Clark having his degree, now studied for ministry and prepared for ministry and is looking at this great big United States of America going, you can go anywhere, man, just go anywhere. And I was. And then God said, yeah, but here's where I'm sending you. This is where you're going, which I am grateful for. I praise God for that today. But I was learning a valuable lesson. You, Rick, don't really call the shots in your life. Yes, you make decisions. It's not like you're, you're a robot. You still have to use your mind, your intellect, your emotions. You have to think through things. You have to do all of that stuff. But God's going to do what God's going to do through you. And look, I'm nobody special. I'm just you. I mean, we're just... We're just all people who are following Jesus. He's gifted you in certain ways. He's placed you in certain places so that you can be an influence for Him. The dying means I'm dying to the power of sin in my life. Let me give you a memory verse. Here's a verse that you can easily remember. You won't have to repeat it over and over. And tomorrow when you wake up, and if your spouse is right there next to you, and, you're, and your spouse says, what's that memory verse again? You'll be able to spout it right out. You won't forget it in your sleep. Here it is. It comes from the Apostle Paul when he says, I die daily. Three words. Got it? Okay, I want you to turn to your neighbor and tell them the memory verse. Go ahead, do it right now. Come on, turn to them. I die daily. There it is. This is Paul telling you, this is Paul telling me, that this dying thing, it's not about, so when did you go to the altar and accept Jesus as your Savior? That's not what this is. This is Paul telling you, I'm glad you went. I'm glad you accepted Jesus as your Savior. I'm glad you were baptized. But what are you doing every day to make sure that you are being under the control of the Spirit of God? And Paul says, well, I die every day. Maybe it's a weird practice, but a good practice, a good something to put into play. When you wake up in the morning and you feel a little like death warmed over anyway, um, remind yourself as you're looking in the mirror, getting ready for work or just washing the sleep out of your eyes, whatever it is, I die daily. I die today, God, I die so that you can live through me. Please, through your spirit, help me do that. I challenge you with that. I die daily. Paul had to do it. 
We have to do it. Okay, I keep going. The Christian life is a life of dying, look at this, to live. This is, it's an oxymoron here that the scripture puts into play, but it's living to identify with Christ. I'm living my life now, not for Rick Clark, but I'm living it to identify with Christ. I'm living to follow Christ's direction in my life. Not my own direction, but Christ's direction. I'm living under the control of Jesus Christ over my life rather than me sitting on the throne and calling the shots for my life. I am living victorious over sin in my life through the power of Jesus Christ. And the only way you and I are ever going to be able to live victorious over sin in our life is to die daily. Because all kinds of things are going to creep up from the time you open your eyes and wake up in the morning to the time you go to bed again. All kinds of things are going to creep up. Look at these passages of Scripture and then we're going to be done. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says this, I am crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live... In the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ and yet I live. It's an oxymoron. I'm, I'm dead and yet I'm alive. I am crucifying the desires of my flesh. I am crucifying the bitterness. I'm crucifying the anger. I'm crucifying the expectations of others. I'm, I'm crucifying the, the power of sin in my life. I am putting all of that to death. I'm done with that kind of living. I have been crucified with Christ. And then in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, Paul is going to go on to say a familiar passage to many people. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, check this out, as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. That's like saying being a living dead person. But, but that's what he has in mind there. I'm a living sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So my life now as a follower of Christ is a life that has been crucified. It is no longer me living it. It is Christ living in me. It is Christ living in you. You are no longer calling the shots. He is calling the shots. Now, with that in mind, let me make these two statements. First is this. Following Jesus will cost you everything. It costs you everything. Following Jesus will cost you your life. It will cost me my life. It will cost me all of the things that this world says is mine. All of the things that this world says belongs to me. All of the power that this world says I have. All of that stuff, all of that stuff is crucified and I have done that because following Jesus has cost me everything. And it has cost you everything. We're all in this same boat together. There's no one that's, that's more valuable than the other in the eyes of God. We are, are all simply His followers, but we are that because we have crucified ourselves. We have denied ourselves for the sake of living the rest of our lives for Jesus Christ. And then the second thing I say to you is this. Because I have been crucified with Christ, I am a dead man walking. I'm a dead man walking. You are a dead man walking. Or you are a dead woman walking. We have 
allowed ourselves to crucify the desires of ourself through the power of the Spirit in us in order that Christ will live in us. I am a dead man walking. I encourage you to look at your neighbor and say that. I'm a dead man walking. Go ahead, tell them. Say that. I'm a dead man walking because in Christ, that's who you are. And as we, as we continue to live each day, then I challenge you once again, when you wake up in the morning, that you, one of the first thoughts that you just allow to run through your head is, is the thought that I die daily. I sacrifice it all so that Christ can live this day through me. And then tomorrow morning when you wake up, you do the same thing. And the next morning when you wake up, you do the same thing. And you continue to do that over and over. That's what Paul did. He died to himself daily. To the desires of himself daily. Daily. That's what we're to do. Can we have a word of prayer together? Father, I thank You so much for Your great mercy towards us, Your continual love for us. Those times where we end up struggling with sin in our life, those times when we surrender to those struggles rather than standing against them, we pray that You will forgive us and we also ask that by Your Spirit You will empower us to continue, continue stepping forward, continuing to live our lives as sacrifices, people who have died to ourselves. And Father, we pray that as we do and as people who are in our sphere of influence, see us, hear us, and, and watch our lives, we pray that they will see Christ in us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for working in us. And we praise your holy name. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen and amen. Rock Church, I want to thank you for being here today. I want to encourage you to remember when you wake up tomorrow... I die daily. Next week when we gather here, we're going to continue on as Jesus reminds His disciples that His mission is that He is going to go to the cross, that He is going to suffer, that He is going to die. He must do that. And then we will see how the disciples end up responding once it starts clicking with them that that is the mission of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great week.